Dr. Gelato Dev Meetup, and I'm your host today, Jun Gong. And uh, let me do a real quick intro about Gelato Network. It's a protocol that automates smart contract executions on Ethereum blockchain. And yesterday, we announced a partnership with, with InstaDev for the launch of InstaDev Actions. Anyways, we are really excited about the meetup, and we are going to have more speakers lined up join us. And it's going to be amazing. So Ari, uh, before we jump in, could you please tell us who you are, what you do, and what are you going to talk about today? Cool. Uh, yeah, great. So I'm Ari. I'm a cryptographer and a developer. Um, I've worked at a couple of different startups here in New York and um, with people in New Zealand and in Europe. And now I work at Gelato, of course. Um, and we're doing smart contract execution on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, I've, I've done some work in what we're gonna hear about today, which is homomorphic encryption and multi-party computation. And I do a lot of work now in smart contracts. So that's me, really pumped up about uh, the blockchain in general. I'm sure you'll, you'll notice. And, uh, but today, just so everyone knows, um, we're, we're really going to some cryptographic topics that are uh, adjacent to the blockchain, but we're not going to be talking too much directly about super blockchain specific concepts. Um, so yeah, that's me. Great. So uh, the meetup will be 30 minutes and after Iris talk, we will have five minutes Q and A. So if you have any questions, feel free to post a question in the chat and uh, for the folks on Clubhouse, uh, feel free to raise your hand. So um, now let's take it away, Ari. Perfect, great. Um, cool, it's, um, I'm gonna take my earphone out of Clubhouse here, but let me know if any activity is happening there. Mm -hmm. All right, can everybody see the screen? That's, uh, you can see my presentation here, yeah? Perfectly fine. Great, okay, cool. So here we go. I'm going to try to get through as much as I can in 25 minutes or so. Um, uh, we'll, we'll see how I do. Um, but I'm super excited to talk about this topic, which is, um, so the topic is threshold signatures. And um, mainly, uh, we're going to talk a tiny bit about the use cases and, and point towards those use cases. But most of the talk is really going to be about what are the building blocks, the cryptographic tools, the cryptographic toolkits, that we need to use in order to make a threshold signature possible. And for, um, for the people here who are blockchain or Ethereum people, well, uh, just to motivate this discussion, um, first of all, what is a threshold signature? So a threshold signature is basically when multiple parties come together to sign something, but uh, the multiple parties actually work together to create just one signature, as opposed to classic multi-sig, if you're used to multi-sig in Bitcoin or Ethereum, you have each of the signers has their own private key and does their own signature, but then we have to validate multiple signatures. Um, especially for things like um, Chainlink or other Oracle um, companies that are helping push real world data onto the blockchain so that us smart contract developers can use it. Um, this is a very helpful because these oracles, basically the way that they verify that the data that they push on chain is actually, um, is actually correct is, well, they have multiple different decentralized parties all signing off on that data. But if, if those parties all have to create a signature and then we have to validate each of the signatures from each of the parties, this becomes incredibly expensive, especially if you're pushing data all the time to the blockchain and it's Ethereum and the gas fees are really high, you might be spending tens of thousands of dollars a day just to, um, just to uh, verify this data that you're pushing on chain. So wouldn't it be great if all of those parties could actually work together to just create one signature so we can just verify one thing on chain. And by just verifying that one signature, we actually verify that you know a threshold of all of those parties involved all have already signed off. So, so all of this cryptography we're dealing with is really to, deal, to help out and get that one optimization there. Um, but the, the crypto behind this is, is really exciting stuff. So um, it's applicable to many other things, as you'll see. So without further ado, let's get into it. So, so Ari, to... yep. Ari, 
Uh, can I maybe just quickly um, jump in why it's also relevant for us at Gelado? Um, I think it's probably, it, it helps quite quite a bit the, the, the listeners. Um, and uh, so for example, for us, as you know, Gelado, what we do is we automate the execution of smart contracts on Ethereum, right? And so you can, for example, instruct these bots that comprise this Gelado network to monitor the prices on Uniswap. And then um, if price move in certain directions, you can execute, let's say, a swap or an, a debt refinance on some protocols. Um, but we can only do that at the moment trustlessly and non-custodial when we have this data available on chain. And so we have to use Ethereum and all the nodes that comprise Ethereum as kind of like the security to, to get that data and to verify that data. Uh, but there's a lot of other interesting data that Ethereum is not really good at storing because it has a lot of, it needs a lot of inputs and stuff. For example, let's say uh, the, vol the trade volume on, on Uniswap, for example, that's just not available um, uh, on chain. And for, for that kind of data, it would be awesome to just cheaply get that from off chain on chain. And, and this is something that, we, um, that, that Ari will discuss and that um, Oracles do in very specific use cases. Um, and I think there's still a, a, a great potential for the future. And uh, yeah, so Ari, sorry for interrupting, just wanted to, to, to kind of paint the picture. <laughs> No, it's great. Exactly how how this might come in in uh, into play for Gelato specifically is super cool and important. And and I'm happy you say it now because we're, I'm going to try to move fast, but we're probably not going to get all the way through everything. So uh, so great. Here we go into the cryptography. So we won't be doing any hardcore math. Just so you know, we can actually do um, quite simple. Um, just talk about pretty simple math, polynomials, the little graphs on the x y plane. And um, with, with, the, with that math, we can already generate a lot of, uh, uh, at least get some intuitions about what's going on cryptographically here. Um, but we will be talking about math, just so you know. So, uh, so what do we need? What are the building blocks? Well, first, we're going to talk about Shamir secret sharing, how to, how to share a secret or split up a secret or create a threshold encryption. Um, and then we're going to look at the homomorphic properties. We need homomorphic encryption as well. And Shamir secret sharing does have some homomorphic properties. And finally, we're going to uh, leverage those homomorphic properties of Shamir, Shamir secret sharing to uh, outline a little bit of how we do multi-party computation, super secure multi-party computation, which is a very exciting subject. Um, and uh, generalizable way beyond just threshold signatures, but is Definitely, you're going to need at least building blocks or components of multi-party computation in order to do threshold signatures. Now, I also just want to say um, that uh, this is not the only way to get to a threshold signature. And I'm pre presenting uh, my understanding here and trying to keep it pretty general. But uh, uh, it gets much more sophisticated when you deal with real implementations and try to become efficient and everything. So really, this is just, just about an overview of the main building blocks. So uh, let's see, Shamir secret sharing. So this comes from Adi Shamir's uh, 1979 paper, How to Share a Secret. It's very, very short and it's a really great paper. I super recommend it. Um, this is a legend in cryptography. And uh, some of you probably have heard of this already, so bear with me. But so this is a protocol, protocol that solves the cryptographic problem of a KN threshold encryption scheme. So. Um, we want any k plus one shares of our of our key to decrypt data, but uh, k or fewer shareholders of this uh, of this uh, we'll call it an encryption key for now um, will reveal no data. Uh, will will not be able to in any way reveal anything about this encrypted data that we have. So it's basically the idea of how can we have uh, 30 parties, and if if 25 of them come together, then we then we can actually reveal the our secret data. But if any 20, and it can be any subset of that 25, right? But if 24 parties come together and share all the information they have and share their their shares with each other, we get zero information about the secret. And this is possible. But first, let's notice how it's not actually that easy to design. Because you might say, hey, Ari, I get it. OK, let's take our secret value. Let's say it's the string secret. And let's pass out a letter to uh, six different um, shareholders here. And now when the six shareholders come together, they can put together the secret. But when they're away, they each just have one letter. So um, of course, this doesn't work. But why doesn't this work? We really have two major problems that Shamir is going to help us overcome. The first one 
is that we all already get some information about the secret, right? The letter that we're holding. And the second issue, of course, is we need everybody to reconstruct the secret, um, for, uh, to be sure that we're reconstructing the secret. If um, So how do we do it if we want the threshold to be less than the entire group? Maybe we'd give everybody two letters and in such a combination where any four of the six with two letters could come together, but now we're leaking even more information to each party. Um, so obviously uh, we need uh, some, some mathematical paradigms to make this work a little bit better. Um, so, so Shamir had an amazing, elegant, super simple idea, which is why don't we use polynomials? So why use polynomials? Because they're going to have an, a property intrinsic to them that's going to be useful for this uh, threshold question we have, which is, okay, we all know that two x, y points define a unique line. And uh, many of us know, and now you're learning, if not, that three points um, will uh, can uniquely define or interpolate a, a parabola. Um, but two points on a parabola infinitely many parabolas might go through there. So, so why, is this, why is this very simple thing about polynomials um, useful for us? Well, that's all we need, right? If, uh, if we can give out shares, which are points on a polynomial, then we know that if our polynomial is of a certain degree, as long as we have a certain number of points on that polynomial equation, we can interpolate it and then um, reconstruct this unknown polynomial. So with just this very simple, uh, very, very simple idea, we can figure out how to share a secret. And this is what Shamir taught us. Super simple paper. So we're going to encode our secret S as some integer. And then we're going to pick a random polynomial of degree K so we just have to set random values for all the coefficients here, a, b, c, d, for as, uh, for as high as this polynomial is. And then we're going to set our secret value, that's an integer, as f of 0 on this random polynomial. So we fix the last coefficient, where it's x to the power 0, as our secret value. And then we're pretty much done. Now we can sample points on this random polynomial that anyone, that nobody knows. Let's say we have a trusted dealer and then after that, nobody knows it. So we sample points on this random polynomial and we give out the point one comma f of one to one player, two comma f of two to another participant, three comma f of three, etc. And now we have exactly the property we want. Each of the shareholders just has a single share. Um, a shareholder by themselves has no idea what parabola we're on here. And even two shareholders by themselves has no idea, zero information about what parabola we're on here. But if three shareholders come together, they can reconstruct this unique parabola and find um, uh, where it crosses the y-axis, find f of zero, and there we go. We found our secret. So this is great because we don't, uh, we automatically have built in, like it doesn't matter which shareholders combine because any three points on this polynomial will reconstruct it. So, so this is great. Now, just a note that uh, the only last thing that makes this a tiny bit more complicated is right now we're, we're using the metaphor of, of real numbers and, um, but all this math actually needs to be done in a finite field. Uh, we're not gonna go into that exactly, at least not right now, uh, we will get to it in a second. So, um, great. So this is Shamir secret sharing. We can share a secret, already quite powerful. But Shamir secret sharing also has homomorphic properties. This is exciting, yes. Um, because it just comes right out of the box of um, the, how polynomials already work. So why, what is a homomorphic property? We'll, we'll actually get to it afterward. We'll define it afterwards. Just follow along with what we're doing here. Um, uh, so let's say we have two, two different lines, right? We have f of x here, this, this first line, downward sloping, negative x plus three. And then we have g of x, and I'm, I'm sort of, I just ripped this graph from somewhere. So I don't know if it's exactly right, but we're calling it uh, 0.25x plus 1.2. So what we've done is, let's say we had uh, a trusted dealer had two secrets, the number three and the number 1.2. And so then they created these two lines, and then they're going to give out points to uh, some players, let's say two players, player one and player two. Player one is going to get 
one comma f of one, they're going to get a share for the, from the secret three that they don't know. They just have one point. So with one point on a line, you don't know what line it is. Uh, they'll also get one comma g of one. So they'll get a share of the second secret of 1.2. And if similarly, they don't know what that number is, uh, what the secret number, the f, of, the f of zero on this polynomial, they don't know what it is. They just have a share um, that they know is part of that number, but they don't know what it is. Great. Um, and this, so each player has these two points. And now here's what's cool about how polynomial math works is adding two polynomials is trivial. And in fact, if we look, we add f of x plus g of x, we'll see that the, um, the two y-intercepts, it's like we just add them together, right? If you add these two, um, these two lines together, you're going to get 3 plus 1.2. And so if x goes to 0, then z of 0 here is going to be 4.2, which is, of course, 3 plus 1.2. So this allows us to do homomorphic addition for free. We're going to, we got to go slowly here to talk about exactly what we're doing, but it's pretty cool because um, player one has a share of some value they don't know and a, a share of another value they don't know, and they can actually add their two shares together. How are they going to do it? Well, they have, um, first of all, it's important that they have the same index, right? They have uh, one comma f of one and one comma g of one. So they can produce a point on a new polynomial, which is going to be one comma f of one plus g of one, which is just adding these two numbers together, right? One comma two, one comma 1.45. So now they have the point one, 3.45. So they have a point on this new polynomial z, uh, z, the line z. Player two can do the same thing locally, add their two shares together, get a new point on some new line. And here's what's so interesting. They don't know the, the first secret, they just had a share. They don't know the second secret, they just have a share. And now, they don't know what they have a new share of, but they know that it's the addition of those two secret values. That if they were to, these two players were to come together and just share uh, their, point, their points on Z, one comma Z of one, two comma Z of two, they could reconstruct the line Z and they could find the number 4.2. And they would know that's the addition of the two numbers they were dealt still without knowing the two original numbers they held. So now we've actually done our very first multi-party computation. The two parties were able to collaboratively reveal an output at secret one plus secret two without ever revealing secret one or secret two in the process. And they did this by leveraging the additive or linear homomorphism between the ciphertext space and the plaintext space. We don't know the, what the ciphertexts hold, but we know that a certain operation on the two ciphertexts on our shares that it maps to doing an operation on the plaintext. And this is very, very powerful because it allows us to do black box computation as we just saw. So the parties, they compute Shamir secret shares of data they don't have any information about, and then they can selectively reveal that to themselves or to other parties, just reveal the outputs or the result of the computation without, still without ever knowing uh, the inputs or any intermediate steps. Um, so, cool. Everybody with me so far? I know I'm like running, running. Um, uh, so let me know if you have a question already. Um, but you might also be asking, and this is a little side note. Oh, I saw a chat. Oh, no. It's, it's, it's just June saying yes. Oh, great. OK, so now I have to go find my. Here we are. You can see again. So great. So side, a little side note that you might be asking, especially if you're, a, if you're already a math person. Uh, if you're not, don't worry. These, this math is analogous. The arithmetic over real numbers is very similar arithmetic over a finite field. So you can stick with the way we're doing things here and there, there's no problem in terms of your understanding, except you know that you have to do this in a finite field, basically reduce modulo a prime when you actually create these polynomials and, and uh, interpolate them. But, uh, but almost the same math applies. But if you are wondering, okay, but I, I do know a little math. So what, why can't, why doesn't this work with the real numbers? And why does it work with, in a finite field or, or over, um, over a prime field? So um, you can, I Googled it. Uh, I've Googled this many, many times. Every time that I scratch my head, I go, wait, so why is it? 
And um, basically the simplest way to prove this, and I won't go too, too in depth, but you can, you can come back to the slide or, or look, uh, which is you can basically prove that with your single point on a line, even with just one point on a line, uh, you can actually deduce the parity of the, uh, of the secret of the, of, uh, the y-intercept. Um, you can figure out if it's even or odd, and you have a proof here of why someone holding uh, the point two comma q of two um, without seeing any other points can actually already figure out whether the secret q of zero is even or odd. So when you do this over the real numbers, you can leak, you might leak this little bit of information, but when you do this over a finite field, you don't have that information leak. Um, last way to give a tiny bit of intuition about this is if you've ever looked at the elliptic curve graph or the graphs of these polynomials, they're, they're very smooth, right? But then when you actually plot them in the finite field and you reduce everything modulo a prime, you see that these smooth graphs where maybe if you had some points, you might be able to make some, get some information about how the, uh, what, um, what polynomial you're on or what the slopes are like. Um, instead in a finite field, like a random cloud of points. And so that is, this is not the mathematical answer of why, but it gives you a little intuition of why um, uh, working over prime fields and prime rings is very useful for cryptography and uh, keeps us keeps uh, us safe from information leak. Okay, cool. So that's a total side note. Next thing that we have to deal with. So we figured out that for free with Shamir secret sharing, we have linear homomorphism. So what about, multiplicative homomorphism. Can we multiply two polynomials? And if we multiply them, is it the same as, uh, uh, can we multiply our two shares, our two points on two different polynomials and then reconstruct that polynomial and have um, a y-intercept that's the multiplication of those values? And the answer, in fact, is actually just, yes, this totally works, right? Except there's one tiny problem. If you look here, we have f of x and g of x again, and we can, uh, find some new polynomial. Oh, no, go back. Yes. We can find some new polynomial, f of x times g of x. And when you multiply these two equations, you see that actually the two, um, the two y-intercepts, it's the multiple, the final, um, the final term here is the multiplication of the last two terms on those lines. 10 is two times five. So we actually do have multiplicative, multiplicative homomorphism as well, except there is a problem, right? What's the problem? The problem is that this new polynomial we have, it has, the degree has changed, right? We had two lines and when we multiply them, now we have a parabola. And so we're actually gonna need more points in order to reconstruct this multiplication. And that's a problem because if you start doing a lot of multiplications, you're gonna need way, way more players and only, a, uh, and in order for this to actually work for us to be able to gather enough points to reconstruct the, the, the future polynomial, which is the multiplication of all of our uh, first polynomials. And this is a problem for the security parameter as well. You could probably imagine why. So, um, so we have a little problem here and I won't go into too much detail about it because I wonder how well I'm doing on time already, but basically there's a trick to avoid this, to, to reduce, you can think about it as reducing the polynomial back to the, uh, original um, to uh, the original power, the, the, um, the original degree. Um, but we can look at this trick. I'm, I'm gonna skip it for now, but you, you can look it over. This is um, using beaver multiplication triples. There are a few other tricks to do this, but basically we find a way to do a multiplication where um, we only use uh, linear transformations, addition of shares or multiplication of a share by a scalar, which is also linear. So we can do that one for free as well. And we do this by also adding a communication protocol in the middle, as well as a pre-processing phase. Okay, I'm seeing there's more chats. I don't wanna. So we are gonna, it's unfortunately we're gonna have four minutes left, but um, there's Perfect. Marcel uh, has a question. Awesome, let me check it out. Oh, so, so why, is, why is there a need, for, why do we need to multiply? This is a great question. So I'm gonna go into that right away um, and we're gonna skip over how this multiplication works, but the most important thing 
to know is that it's possible to do, but only if we add some schemes. So we need a round of communication. It, whereas in um, addition, we only, we could just do it locally. I could have a bunch of shares and a bunch of secret values, add them all together. And then I have the addition of all those values and we didn't need to do any, um, any communication protocol multiplication, a little bit more complicated, uh, but it's possible if we add some communications where we, where we reveal some masked values to each other, which allow us to compute a multiplication um, without ever needing to do this expensive thing where the degree of the polynomial goes up. And why do we want multiplication? So basically it's possible, you'll just have to trust me that we can do it through communication, but why do we want this? A uh, little recap, by the way, we can add shares, we can multiply shares by a, a public value or um, shift a share over by a public value. And all of that we can do homomorphically for free. For free, meaning with no fancy protocols or communication protocols in order to do this computation. We can do multiplicative homomorphism as well, but we need a round of communication. And this becomes a very important bottle bottleneck for multi-party computation. But why? is addition and multiplication important? It's important because if we can prove that we can do addition homomorphically and that we can do multiplication homomorphically, then we are in theory completely done. Now shareholders could cooperate to do arbitrary encrypted computations because every single computation that you can express can actually be um, compiled, boiled down into a circuit, a circuit of many additions and multiplications. Uh, Boolean circuits work like this, so it's just additions and multiplications of, of uh, zero and one bits, which we can also do uh, slightly different. I would explain that in a different lecture. But um, so you can just take any Boolean circuit you have, and if you can do addition and multiplication, then uh, you can do arbitrary computation. Um, and this is really, really exciting. Um, there's a lot just to give a very, very brief thought about what you can do with black box computation, arbitrary black box computation, oh, I'll go back, is imagine this is the canonical example that's always given. Imagine there are two countries and they each have satellites up in the air and those satellites, um, they don't want to reveal to each other where they leave their satellites. These countries are maybe enemies or countries in general are usually not very keen on revealing the locations of their satellites, but Satellites can actually, in the air, they actually do sometimes hit each other and that costs both countries billions of dollars. So the two countries can pass out shares of their satellites trajectories to each other and then jointly compute just whether or not their satellites will have an intersection. So the only share they reveal is a zero or a one, which says these satellites will hit at some point in the near future or they won't. And this is incredibly powerful. Now the two countries that don't want to collaborate and tell each other everything can just collaborate to reveal very specific outputs. And this has many, many use cases. And finally, one of them is threshold signatures, of course, because why not one algorithm we could do homomorphically is we could all hold shares of an ECDSA private key and then we could run a little uh, algorithm so that we end up each with a share of a signature on that ECDSA private key. And then one, we can leverage a lot of natural properties to make this actually very easy and very useful with multi-party computation because we can actually verify, we can all then show, uh, reveal our shares of the signature, construct the signature and A, by definition, because of how signatures work, we know we aren't revealing anything about the private key when we just reconstruct the signature. So that's great. We just did a signature without ever inputting a private key into any specific process. Secondly, um, because we can actually just verify the signature, we know that nobody cheated on the computation. Um, so we don't have to do any expensive cheater detection stuff during. Um, and basically, if the last thing is since we are Shamir secret shares, the way I presented them was over a prime ring or, or sorry, over a prime field. Um, so are elliptic curves. So if you use the same prime for the Shamir secret shares that an elliptic curve uses, then it's actually, you'll see that the circuit we need to create or the set of additions and multiplications is quite simple here. We just need to do this um, addition and one inversion or division and one multiplication 
all mod n, which is the same modulus that we're using for our Samir secret sharing. So basically, it's just a couple of operations and mainly only one multiplication uh, gate. So one round of communication in the middle of this protocol um, to create a, an ECDSA signature. Um, and I know I'm already running over time. So, so these are some of the building blocks. Basically, it, it gets a lot more complicated and to make these efficient because multiputation has some efficiency problems. Um, uh, what are some of the limitations in the bottleneck? The main limitation is this: the rounds of communication that are incurred by, uh, by doing encrypted multiple um, they stop MPC from actually in practice doing any arbitrary computation because if the circuits get really, really big and mainly if the multiplicative depth of the circuit becomes very important mm -hmm. for party computation, um, you get this explodes, you need many, many rounds of communication and the computations go quite slow. Um, the other limitation that's important to imagine is these black box program, black box compute computations work a bit differently than just normal computer programs to evaluate. For instance, if you think about if-then branching, well, if we're branching if-then, but we don't know the value that uh, the value that we're branching on is a value that has to be unknown, well, we can't just walk one branch. So the only way to compute um, like the so something that has an if-then branching is actually to follow all the paths, all the branches, and you have uh, secret values that that will either be zero or not zero so that you do a linear combination at the end of all the branches you took and you actually get the answer because all the branches you didn't take are multiplied by zero, but you don't know which one you actually use. So, so there are some things that make this a bit more difficult than just, okay, now you have a black box computer. Um, and so when you actually do this in practice and apply threshold signatures, you can read about how Chainlink is doing it. You'll see they don't do exactly an ECDSA signature, but just a Schnorr, a Schnorr signature to see if that um, makes this multi-party computation a little easier and many other optimizations and little tricks that are quite important if you really wanna do this securely. Um, now, finally, what are the applications here? Well, I told you about one, you know, the satellites and there are many more, but the applications specifically of threshold signatures and to blockchain, there are many, they're quite, quite important. The very most obvious one is just a better multisig. So this is just, it's just like multisig, um, if you know about multi-sig in Bitcoin or um, multi-sig contracts in Ethereum, but it's much better because nobody knows that it's a multi-sig. It looks just like a normal EOA signing. So it's less gas on Ethereum. It's more, it's just more immediately operable, like interoperable with the blockchains because they're used to seeing exactly these signatures. It's not a special, um, uh, a special type of multi-sig transaction. Um, also, you can have an arbitrary number of signers, so it could be 800, uh, 600 out of the 800 signers, and you can't really do that with just a normal multi-sig. Um, and of course, saving on gas, so Chainlink is already doing this, what we talked about now when we're signing off on data. We can actually all sign off by running this as secure process off chain produce this signature, and then it's just one transaction to send the signature to the contract and the signature with a single EC recover, if we actually do a, a multi-party computation of an ECDSA signature, we just need one EC recover about 4,000 gas, and we can verify potentially thousands of signatures. So this could be very, very powerful. Um, so that's your brief overview. Um, uh, we're done. Um, let me know any more questions. I saw some things in the chat. Yes, we have so many questions and it's really good. And then uh, let's say let's um, if everyone's on board, maybe we can stay up like five minutes, five more minutes and then answer all the questions, shall we? Yeah, um, I'm just, I can't find them in the chat. Go to the chat. <laughs> One second, let me. Um, maybe June, could you, could you maybe yeah. read some of them? Yeah, it's trying to read. Oh, okay, I see him now. Sorry. Yeah, I've got him. Or maybe um, um, Marcel, do you just want to you you edit a bunch of them? Maybe you just want to ask one of them, the the, the one that's uh, most interesting to yeah, yourself. I can, can you hear me? Yep, yeah, I can hear you. Great. Yeah, my first question was regarding the protocol because you were talking about um, the dynamism like um, that uh, it's sort of an interactive protocol. So I was wondering 
um, if the participants have to be online, basically mostly at the same time in order to create a valid signature, like K, K plus one participants? Yes. So you can do this in an asynchronous manner, um, but you can, but usually it's done in more in a synchronous or at least partially synchronous manner so that there's kind of an online phase. Um, uh, there's also, a, uh, just so you know, a little bit of complexities in terms of, uh, just to know though, the only thing that makes this protocol need to be online and need to have this dynamism is only because of these multiplications, right? All the yep. linear things, we can just all locally do them with our shares and just produce a result and at the end communicate with each other. So it's only the multiplications that have this issue. but. To make the multiplications work, they do a number of things to make it efficient. So also they have a pre-processing phase so that things that don't have to do with the values you're actually multiplying, but are needed for the protocol, you can do that earlier, not while you're actually trying to compute this signature, but just when there's downtime, all of these parties can compute together to, you, to create basically some random unknown values that are gonna be helpful in the online phase. And the online phase is usually um, uh, synchronous or partially synchronous because the only way for it to go fast is for each of us to do some of these local computations then all the parties send messages to each other broadcast messages collect the messages they've received and then continue on evaluating the computation in rounds like this um, but it's also possible to do it asynchronously the, the rounds would just be much longer you'd basically post your result or intermediate results for a certain round of computation. Once there is enough results posted on the forum, then you can collect them all, do a little bit more computation, post another result. Um, so there's a number of ways to do this, but you do have these, it, these rounds of computing and communicating. Hopefully that helps answer your question. Yeah, okay, that's, um, that's a good answer. But I, my next question is also about the, the context. I think then it would make, make it easier for me to, to, to understand um, or put into context what you just said. Um, since I'm not really familiar with uh, Gelato, I just heard about it a couple of days ago. Um, so I want to know where the, the MPC or the thresh, threshold signature scheme is um, used for. Um, if it was, if it's usually used against centralization um, aspects, like to target uh, uh, counter uh, centralization, similar to like um, um, how REN is doing that for managing mm -hmm. uh, Bitcoin private keys, or is it um, more about um, privacy preserving properties for for messages? Um, for example, for for like mine extractable value, and um, you want to like hide your transactions maybe from from adversarial parties. So yes, great question. I think uh, it's more for now, right now, it's more for the first one, though this is obviously also very useful to privacy preserving things, right? Um, but for now, uh, as, as Hilmar said at the beginning, maybe maybe we weren't here yet too, but or no worries. Um, but uh, this would be very useful for Gelato because we do these automatic executions in the future based on conditions. Maybe that condition is if the price ratio of these two assets reaches some critical value, then do, uh, do my operation. But then of course we need an Oracle that's letting us know about the, this price ratio or, or some other conditions, right? So we need, um, we need some data from off chain to be on chain so that our automatic execution can actually be secure for our users. And um, it's when you bring, when you do this oracleizing, when you bring this off-chain data on chain and you don't want to just trust a central party that they're providing you the correct data, then you need this uh, group of parties all signing off on something. And that can be very inefficient with gas, but gets much, much more efficient if we use these multi-party computation protocols in order to generate threshold signatures, as opposed to each party signing and uh, validating some off-chain data that we're pushing on chain as being really correct. Um, so, but, so, but we're, so far though, it's very interesting, Gelato isn't really dealing with uh, keeping privacy of the, of the thing you want to execute, um, as in like uh, somehow passing it on, on chain, but somehow encrypted and only the nodes in the back can decrypt it. Um, we're not uh, planning on anything like that just, just yet, um, but yeah. Okay, so it's mostly for v validation of yes, data. Yes, for the validation purposes, exactly. Okay, cool, thanks. Yeah, um, in, in practice, um, a lot of data, certain executions require available on chain or it's just 
too gas intensive to, to get on chain. Um, uh, either example are, for example, just routes across decentralized exchanges um, or um, the volatility or, or trading volume of, of, of DEXs or data basically that is not stored or collected in smart contracts. Um, this is this is super important for a lot of financial use cases and um, Gelado is really focused on automating individual transaction of of users. So you're like for yourself to move your debt position between protocols to execute a trade based on certain conditions. And what usually um, Oracle solutions do, they aggregate information into one contract and then any everyone can access that one, right? But we need very much more specific data than that. Um, and so uh, uh, in these use cases, I think it's it's really uh, interesting if we could, um, and, and for, for these kind of data points, which is also important, you don't need the same security guarantees as you would need for these aggregated data points as price feeds, because there are no like 100 depths relying on that price feed. For, for certain transactions, this is just one transaction for one user, right? There you can have different security guarantees and there may be um, four different nodes that sign off of something suffice to make uh, an assumption that it's secure um, based on a certain stake that these nodes um, had to stake. Um, so um, yeah, so that, that's why it's, it's really cool for us uh, in the future and obviously some privacy aspects um, also, but, but these are, I think they can also be achieved in, in other yeah, and um, yes, I mean, uh, one, one cool way to think about it is currently with Auto, when we do executions, that payload the user wants to be executed uh, is, uh, is sent to us, but wouldn't it be cool if we could actually generate the payloads on the fly so that based on the certain conditions of the Ethereum network that you, that you want to be monitoring, we can actually, you know, uh, change the play. For instance, let's say the slippage value in a Uniswap trade, we could inject slippage value at the top of the trade to give you a safe one. But we can only do that if it's trusted that then the payload that we're clicking is actually what the user wanted. And so then we'd need to do this validation and this uh, decentralized signing off. And, and then these signatures would come in very handy. Cool. Anything else? I think we're good. Um, yeah. Uh, there's Richard, uh, he has a question. Uh, Richard, do you wanna ask? Yeah, hello guys. My question is, is there already like something visual where we could kind of see this at play? Kind of worked out from, you know, from a wallet to another wallet? Ah, in, on Ethereum, on the blockchain, I'm sure there are some projects already. And for instance, Ren, if you've ever used a Ren bridge, you're actually utilizing some multi-party computation. But, but, but yeah, watching what's, um, I've also done some ECD, I can point to transactions on the Bitcoin blockchain. I can say, hey, that one actually, that private key was actually distributed and generated. Uh, by many people, but one cool thing here is it's there might it might be the the beautiful thing is actually there's not much to see right because at the end you just create a signature in your wallet. This signature, oh, I became unstable. People still hear me? Um, yes. Great. Um, that now you've just at the end of this big long process you've actually signed your transaction, so there's not too much to see. Um, it's what's happening in the back with all. It's working, but to get a sense of these nodes work together and run the protocol, there are some videos and stuff on YouTube. I could link one, one that ShareMind has done. That is a pretty good primer of the way they do three-party computation with some nice visuals. Um, yeah. But it's uh, an experiment, not like actual uh, demo. Yeah. All right. Now, excellent, Ari. I'll definitely look into that. And if you don't mind sharing, you know, your Twitter handle or anything like that, you know, just so I could follow it and kind of, you know, inform myself and learn more about it, I would greatly appreciate it. Of course. Yeah. I'm at Rapist on Twitter and I can, I can also make this a little, the, the, um, the kind of crappy PowerPoint I did public well, and you have lots of information on this stuff. I um, I, I'm not a mathematician. I've hung out with some PhDs who help understand some of these things. Even before I met them, I learned a, a good amount of this just by Googling my way. 
So, um, so be brave and, and dive into that as well. Yes, please follow me everywhere. Sounds great. Yes. Excellent. Well, great. Thank you. So we will share the uh, podcast.